Good morning. That was a little loud. I'll back up. Do we have any first-time visitors? I don't see any. At the, there'll be a session meeting right after service. Those of you who sit on session, as a deacon now, I don't have to. So that's a, that, that's a plus. <clears throat> uh, Easter, you guys, uh, 31st, and there'll be an egg hunt out here after the service after the service on Easter. We also have the Monday, Thursday, which is gonna be on the 28th at 7 p.m. here at the church. Friday the 22nd is gonna be movie night, and it is... Oh, it's right there. Well, it doesn't say what movie, oh yeah, it does. Robin Hood. It's gonna be the old Errol Flynn, I think, Robin Hood. Do we uh, have any other announcements? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, we all need to keep this island in our prayers because. Uh, We've had uh, thousands of crazies come on the island as far as the spring breakers. Also, got a new stage over here. Uh, Brother Allen came and worked with me all day yesterday to finish that up. But uh, that's where the choir is going to be moving. For anyone, I've been asked by a couple of people, well, what's it for? That's our new offering area. No. <laughs> Any other announcements? <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to send out an invitation. I've been doing a Bible study on Wednesday night in the GI at my house at uh, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. I've been doing it for four years. If anybody here, men, want to come to a Bible study on the far west end, you're more than welcome. Check with me, and I'll give you an address. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bob. <laughs> else? I'll turn it over to Chris. Well, I have uh, kind of an announcement and uh, not really a request, just throwing something out there. Um, we, for the past number of years, at least since I've been here, when a number of other people come on Easter Sunday, they bring quite a number of children and Darcy has helped us with that, at least since I've been here, and I haven't been able to get in touch with her this year. So the elders and I have talked about um, how to go about doing that this year, and we don't want to pressure anyone into volunteering because it is quite a task. But if that is something that the Lord is laying on your heart and something that you would be really excited about, Please let me know, because uh, time is short. So just talk to me after the service if, uh, if that's something you'd be interested in helping out with. If not, the Lord has a plan, and he'll work it out. Um, well, are there any prayer requests or updates? Yes, please. Praise the Lord for sure. We rejoice with you. Yes.
Amen. We keep praying and trusting the Lord. Amen. Anyone else? Oh, sorry, yes. Yes, yeah. Prayers for Dwight. Oh, yes, Dale. All right. All right. Amen. All right. Well, we will certainly take all that and more to the Lord when we go to him in prayer as we worship him together in this uh, beautiful day. And now Rick is going to come and lead us as we prepare our hearts to worship. That's awesome to hear, Dale, that you're quitting smoking. But I know that that just means your appetite will go up. You're always in here eating first thing in the morning, so we're going to have to lock the refrigerator. But that's all right. <laughs> now for our prayer of preparation. Oh, Lord, we cry out for revival in our hearts and your church. Pour out your spirit upon us and ignite a passion for your presence. Fan the flames of worship within us and awaken us to a deeper hunger for you. May this time of worship be a catalyst for revival and transformation in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. you see your tired servants and the broken wounded soldiers oh how much we need your precious healing hand we need the power of the cross as the only source for us when we stand up facing fire no battle cry, restore your church again, touch your people once again, with your precious holy hand, we pray, let your kingdom shine upon this earth. living glory 
glorious church not for temporary deeds but to restore authority and power let a mighty rushing wind blow in touch your people your people once again. Thank you, Angela. Now for our call to worship on the monitors and it is responsive praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul praises to God all my life long happy are those whose help is in God creator of heaven and earth who is forever faithful setting prisoners free, and opening the eyes of the blind, lifting up those who are bowed down and loving the righteous. The Lord protects strangers and upholds the orphan and widow, but the way of the wicked is brought to ruin. The Lord our God will reign forever for all generations. Praise the Lord. Now, if you please stand for our three songs of worship.
seated. Graham, are you wearing high heels? Well, kid's getting big, man. I mean, I don't know what happened, Roman, but it seems like you've kind of stopped and he's, he's moving to catch up. Now for our call to confession. It's from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We believe, and although we fall short, we hold tight to his word. Let's take a moment for silent confession. If you would join me in our prayer of confession, it'll be on the monitors. Heavenly Father, 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is life to those who call upon his name. Yet there are still so many who do not believe, and even more who have not truly heard. Your great commission calls us to share Jesus with our hurting world. Yet we confess that we miss countless opportunities to bring God's loving message of salvation to others. Forgive us for shying away from the joy of this privilege. Renew in us a heart for the lost. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Open our eyes to creative ways of taking that next step to bless others with the hope of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for our affirmation of faith. It's from the Heidelberg Catechism, question number 31. And it's responsive. Please stand and remain standing for the uh, glory of Patri. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance. Our only high priest who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given yourself, that you have done everything that was necessary everything that could be done, everything that we couldn't do, so that now we have the right to be called children of God. And Lord, because we are children of God, we come boldly to you, thanking you for the good news that we've heard today. We know that when we come to you, you will hear us. And we know that whatever we ask in the name of Jesus, according to your will, will be done. And so we give you praise. Lord, we ask also that as this is such a, a place where people come to visit, where people come for short times, weekends, vacations. Lord, not only that you would keep those who reside here safe, but that you would give us opportunities to be your light, to minister your grace, to share the truth of your love. Lord, even as we have experienced your faithfulness in answer to our prayers, give us 
will help us to see the opportunities that we have to share what we know and what we have experienced. Not only that you are God, but that you save all who call upon your name. Lord, remind us that this world is not our home. That the joy that we have looks far beyond anything we see or feel. But we long and wait for the day when you call our name to be with you forever. Lord, we ask that you would even fill our hearts today knowing that you are with us. Fill us with your presence. We ask it in your name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord as our ushers come forward for this morning's tithes and offerings. Now, if you're like me and grew up in church, many of you may have 
grown up with phrases like this. You're the only Jesus that some may ever see. Or you're the only Bible that some may ever read. Well, I'd like to suggest that there's a problem with phrases like that. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, or maybe you haven't particularly thought about it, but maybe there's something inside you that's felt that there is a problem with phrases like that. And here's why I would say that. Because Jesus was perfect, and the Bible is inerrant and infallible, and we're not. You're not perfect. You're not infallible. You're not inerrant. But at least in my experience, phrases like that, you're the only Bible that people will ever read, give the impression that we as Christians should be so above reproach that any mistake that we make, any sin that we commit, it would be letting God down or letting others down, letting the loss down. Maybe you, you caused someone to doubt or maybe something that you did caused someone else not to believe because you made a mistake. Well, maybe there are some Bible passages that would lead someone to think of phrases like that. Well, actually, there are, and here are a few of them, uh, beginning with Titus chapter 2. Paul writes to Titus in chapter 2, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. So Paul is encouraging Timothy, or Titus to have a sound mind to do good things and to have a good understanding of theology. And again, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verse 14, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless or innocent, Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And then Peter as well. It's not just Paul. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. And when he says Gentiles here, he does it mean Gentiles as opposed to Jews, he's using Gentiles as a term for those who don't know Jesus. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So there is encouragement to be holy, to live like God, so that we can be an example to those who don't know God. But is God, through those apostles and in those three passages, saying that as Christians, you can't make mistakes, because then you're going to be an, a bad example to people? Is that what he's saying? You can never sin, you can never make mistakes, and in all situations, you have to be perfect. Now, it could seem that way, and sometimes it certainly feels that way, doesn't it? As Christians, we feel like we have to be on our best behavior. But this is not what's being said in those passages. We are being encouraged toward godly behavior. We are being encouraged to be and become more like Jesus. But are any of those passages saying that if we failed or if we don't live up to all those expectations perfectly, then we failed God. Is that what they're saying? Well, I found that for far too long, 
churchgoers have felt the need to be better than those who are outside the church. They're afraid to mess up, or maybe a better way to put it is they're afraid to admit that they've messed up. And what does that often lead to? It leads to dishonest and hypocritical Christianity. You see, when people are trying to live up to a standard that is unreachable, unattainable, and then they fail to reach that standard, then they're unwilling or unable to admit it. What does that look like? Well, to those on the outside, it looks like a bunch of fakes. It looks like counterfeits, imitations. I personally believe through hundreds of conversations that I've had with people who no longer go to church, that that is one of the primary reasons so many people have left the church in the last 40 to 50 years. You see, one of the things that current generations are looking for is authenticity. They want to see someone they want to see people, they want to see things that are real. I don't know if you're familiar with how generations are generally divided up, but here's one uh, way that generations are divided up. I would be considered barely into the Gen X category, uh, and then um, most of you all would be in the boomer category, and then, uh, then you have the... <laughs> Millennials and the, the Gen Z and whatever else. But, um, but millennials and Gen Z, they're, they're looking for authenticity. And I found that to be true. And like I said, hundreds of conversations with people who either, I would say, have left the church or have tried out the church. If it's not real or if they don't perceive it to be real, they don't want it. Why do you think that reality TV has become so popular in the last 30 years? According to uh, one site, techpenny.com, reality TV now makes up around, about 30% of primetime TV. In 2016, 77% of U.S. TV households watched reality TV shows. In 2000, or excuse me, 18 to 29 year olds watch reality TV shows the most, with 69% of those who responded to this particular survey in that age range, 18 to 19, 20 year, 29 year olds, reporting that they primarily watch reality TV. Now, the ironic thing about that is reality TV is not reality. I read another article that said you could basically call reality TV partially scripted television. Because yes, there are real people who are doing real things, but they're partially being told what to do. But nevertheless, it's being viewed because people are looking for something real. Billy Graham, years ago, he was asked, um, it's people used to email him questions, and someone asked, hey, we're, we're having a big family reunion this summer, and I admit that my husband and I are kind of nervous because most of our relatives aren't religious. We don't want to come across as self-righteous, but I guess we ought to take a stand somehow for Jesus. But should we just not go? Billy Graham responded, I sincerely hope you won't avoid your family's reunion, but instead of dreading it, I hope you'll go with an attitude of anticipation and joy. And you will, if you see this, not as a burden, but as, God, as a God-given opportunity, an opportunity that he is giving you to influence your family for good. No, you don't want to come across as negative or self-righteous. That usually turns people away from Jesus instead of toward him. But what if others saw Christ's love and joy in your lives? What if your relatives saw Christ's hope and peace in your hearts? 
Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Pray, therefore, that God will go before you and make you a blessing to your family. Some in your extended family may already love God, and he can use you to encourage them. Some may be seeking God or wondering what the future holds for them, and he can use you to point them to Jesus. Some may have no interest in Christ or may even scorn you, but God can still use you to plant seeds of faith in their hearts. Remember, God hasn't called you to avoid unbelievers, but to help them and point them to Christ. We have been chosen, the Bible says, to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Those are good words. Unfortunately, in recent decades, I've heard and read some not so good words. As I've seen a number of Christian leaders trying to deal with this trend of a number of people and you could even say generations walking away from the church, leaving the church, but they've gone about it the wrong way. And here are a few examples. In an article, Why Nobody Wants to Be Around Christians Anymore, a pastor writes this. Thinking people are tired of this, are tired of the fact that Christians are believing and thinking that they're right and everyone else's way is wrong. They know that this kind of attitude will not work in a pluralistic world. More and more people are working nine to five or whatever their schedules, and they're doing so beside people of a variety of faith traditions, as well as beside those who are agnostic and atheistic. They're discovering many different ways that valid truth can be found and experienced in many different places. As a consequence, they're no longer willing to sit in pews and listen to preachers pretend that when Jesus said, I am the way, nobody comes to the Father but me, that Jesus was starting a new religion and arguing that anybody who didn't join his religion, his way, or bow down to him, he would condemn them to hell. It's madness. Such theology won't work in today's world. It might have worked in the southern states back in the turn of the 20th century, but it won't work today. You don't have to like that. You don't even have to agree with it. But if you're serious about rescuing your dying church from its rendezvous with death, you better soften, compromise, rethink your theology. It really doesn't matter what you call it, but if you want your church world to stop diminishing, you had better wise up and pay attention, pay close attention to what those leaving your pews are trying to say. So this person's solution is to set aside what you believe in order to make those who don't believe what you believe happy. And here's another pastor who's, I would say, got it wrong. And I, I don't know if I put this slide. Did I put a picture in there next, Nancy? I don't think I put it. No, I didn't put it in there. That's all right. Um, so I saw this uh, from a, a friend of mine. I, I won't use the friend's name, but a friend that Chris and I used to be very close to. And this friend posted what this person said. And they said, when Christians become convinced that we are the only authority on truth, that anyone who d disagrees with us is evil, and things will only get better if we control all positions of power, then we've got it wrong. Well, what's wrong with that kind of statement? Well, let, let's look at those one by one. When Christians become convinced that we are the only authority on truth. Now, this was a pastor who was saying this. What's wrong with that statement? Well, first of all, I would say that most Christians don't think that they are the only authority. Most Christians that I know would say that God is the only authority and that his word is what teaches us what his authority says. 
and they would be correct. Can other sources speak to the truth? Of course. There's truth in all of the world. But any of that truth, supposed truth, that people would say contradicts what God says is no truth at all. So believing that doesn't make the church hypocrites. Believing that doesn't make believers inauthentic. Everyone believes in a source, don't they? Everyone's truth comes from somewhere, and whatever they believe that source is ultimately is believed in by faith, is it not? So for Christians, that source by which we believe in faith is the Bible. For others... You can fill in the blank. There's a lot of sources, there's a lot of places where people get their idea of truth. But believing for us that the Bible is that source which teaches us about who God is, who Jesus is, what he did, what it means for us, that doesn't make us unloving, unjust, or insincere. Well, the second thing this pastor says is that not that anyone who disagrees with us is evil. Again, I would say that most Christians I know don't think that way. Most Christians I know don't think that most people who disagree with you are evil. Are there some that think that way? Sure. But is it possible that more often than not, it's just received that way. Because many times, when we disagree, people are offended. Because often, people don't define themselves just by what they do. They think that what they do defines who they are. But we who know Jesus, we understand something, don't we? We understand that what Jesus did defines who we are. It's not what we do. And so when we say this is right, this is wrong, it is often true that people are easily offended because they think we're saying you do this, therefore you're evil. That's not what we're saying. We're saying those things are wrong. But every human being is created in the image of God. Every human being has value. It's just that not every action has value. And then the last thing this pastor said, things will only get better or we think that things will only get better if we control all positions of power. Again, this is a misunderstanding of a fundamental belief. Do most Christians that I know believe that other Christians, or at least morally upright people, would be the best people to be in public office? Yes, of course. We think that that's true. We think that that will benefit society, and we think that that will benefit those who are the future of society. But do most Christians that I know think that that means we must control those positions? Of course not. We know that God is in control. The last thing that I read recently in a similar vein is by another pastor. He says, one way to reach the current generations is to be concerned about the things they're concerned about and to stop trying to be right all the time. A faith that doesn't propel its adherents to act is no faith at all. Jesus' brand of acti activism was so threatening to the religious and political Pubas, I think is what he's saying, of his day, 
that he was murdered for it. Well, that's not actually why he was murdered, but let's keep going. Please don't tell me that Jesus had to die in order for God to forgive us. God has been in the forgiving business since Adam tied on his first fig leaf in the Garden of Eden. So here's a pastor that says, look, let's just try to relate to the people of this generation, and we don't even need to believe that Jesus died for sins. So why am I spending so much time on these, what I would call wrong commentaries on the church or how the church should change in order to relate to society? Because what you see in these commentaries that are coming from supposed preachers is a reaction to criticisms of the church saying, look, you just need to chill out. You just need to compromise. You just need to stop being so uptight. And if you do that, you won't receive so much criticism and more people will be accepting of you and they'll join you. But that's just not true. What that actually does is it weakens the church. And that's what we've seen, is it not? You see, what's actually needed is the same thing that has always been needed. And that's an honest portrayal of two things. Admitting, I am still an imperfect person, but I am saved by a perfect Savior. Yes, I'm different. Yes, I'm a new creation. But I still make mistakes. As a matter of fact, let's go have a drink and I'll tell you about some of those. So what if instead of being the only Jesus people will ever see, we were the only Chris or Teresa or Nancy, or Kathy, that people ever saw. And that, that led them to trust so that we could show them the real Jesus. Because isn't he the only one who's perfect? So what if instead of being the only Bible that people ever read, we were the only one who showed them the word of God. We were the one who led them to read the scriptures, to see the beauty and life that could be found there. You see, we may sometimes lie, but God always tells the truth. We may break promises, but God is always faithful. We will fail. But God can always be trusted. So don't try to be something you're not. In our age of digital manipulation, it's easy to produce something fake, isn't it? But think about this. When you first came to Jesus, did he turn you away? No, he welcomed you with open arms, and you were forgiven. So why start pretending now? There's no reason. Be honest. Be yourself. It's so tempting to try to pretend, to want to pretend for others, to want to pretend even for God, and sometimes to try to pretend for ourselves. Now, am I suggesting that we just accept sin and say, well, you know, that's just who I am? That's not what I'm saying at all. Remember those passages at the beginning. God wants us to become more like Jesus. He wants us to become holy. 
But it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from an 80s movie. I don't know if you ever saw Buckaroo Banzai. No matter where you go, there you are. So wherever you are at this point in your life, that is you. So why hide from it? Why hide it from others? It's who you are. God knows it. He's not fooled. So where are you? Well, the truth is, you're just as forgiven as you were a year ago. You're just as forgiven as you were five years ago. You're just as forgiven as you were 10 years ago. And you're just as, you, as forgiven as you were 10 seconds ago. Those who don't yet know Jesus are longing to see somebody who is real, somebody who is just as broken as they are so that we can point them to the only one who can fix their brokenness. You see, when you call customer service, don't you hate going through those 10 tiers of, you know, press this button for this menu, and then press this, press this button to get back to the main menu, and then ultimately you finally get to the thing that says, press this button for customer service, and then it takes you to another menu. You just want to speak to a real person, right? Well, that's what people want. They want to speak to you, a real person. So instead of us putting up barriers, disguises, May God help us to learn to be the real, authentic people that God already loves, accepts, and has forgiven in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, you tell us that Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. Remind us that that's no less true today than when we first came to you. And so we can be honest about ourselves with you. We can be honest about ourselves with those around us. And Lord, use us Use our honesty, use our authenticity as we point people to you, not ourselves, to show them that you are the only perfect one. There's only one Jesus that people will ever see, and you are him. Lord, Shine your light through us so that others may see you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this last song together. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
have to say, I, that's one of the things that I am so thankful for in West Isle, um, and I probably mentioned this sometime recently, but uh, I was talking, I know I was talking with somebody in the last few weeks, and uh, even when I was interviewing for this position at West Isle, I remember my first Zoom call, and I got off of that call, and I went to Krista, and I said, uh, these people are the real deal. <laughs> and I know this is a congregation full of people who are authentic, who are real. And that allows the light of Jesus to shine through you. And so I pray that the Lord will continue to shine through you as you not only seek to live for him, but recognize that he is the one who makes you who you are. Continue to glorify him in your lives through honest, authentic living and the way that you interact with others through just who you are. So I'm thankful for you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.